Hello, hello. For this video, we're going to start looking at chapter 10. So, chapter 10 is all about looking at academic standards, looking at curriculum, and looking at accountability for teachers and schools. This is an extremely important topic, but I have to admit, it's not the most exciting one in the world. So, when creating this PowerPoint, I asked myself the question, and I decided, all right, this is going to be the chapter where we try to meme it up to try to make it a bit more interesting. So let's start with the question of why standards? You know, why do we have standards? Why is this something important? Well, would you build a house without having some sort of an idea of where you were going with it? Of what was expected of you? A blueprint or a plan? Probably not. Standards are ex extremely important to help us figure out what it is we should be teaching, what our students should be learning. It's difficult to learn or to teach if you don't know where you're going and if you don't know what the expected end result is. So standards are important. And I have to admit there is a certain amount of logic behind the idea of having a level of achievement in mind. Of <clears throat> what is it that you expect to get out of any undertaking, let alone teaching and learning. So we can obviously see the usefulness of standards, but what are they? You may not even be exactly certain what I mean when I say standards. So a standard can be described a lot of ways. Yes, it is a statement of what your final goal is. So when you're going into creating your eighth grade math class, what is it you expect your students to get out of it? But it's also a statement regarding the norm of excellence or the criterion that you're using to judge whether or not your students have done well enough. And depending on your perspective, that could also include what your definition of mastery is for mastery learning. Standards are really necessary so that you can make sure that learning has taken place in the classroom. <clears throat> no, Bruce Banner's not right. There is a plan. There's always got to be a plan in the classroom. That plan provides accountability to make sure that learning has taken place and to improve learning. So, if standards are the statement of what that final goal is, that target, that bullseye, Benchmarks are what happen along the way to meeting that goal. So your benchmarks are the little measurable steps or stages along the way. Or you might even consider it to be the stepping stones along the path or the journey. So it's not just about that you make it to the destination, but benchmarks are checkpoints along the way to make sure that you're headed in the right direction. So another way we can look at benchmarks is to describe them as points or landmarks along the way toward achieving your goal. So if here's where you start in the academic year and here's where you finish, you don't just want to measure the start point and the end point. You need to measure the journey along the way. And those measurements can also let you know whether or not you are successfully achieving your goals, whether or not you're on the right track. And if you find your students are scoring too low, then you know you need to course correct to get back on track if you want to meet that standard there at the end. So benchmarks can be a big deal for teachers. Um, the idea of, you know, watching this to see, okay, where are we and, you know, are my scores where I expect them to be? So. If I had a crystal ball, I would tell you that if you plan on moving forward in teacher education, you're going to be spending a lot of time looking at standards, in particular, the NTASC standards and the National Board of Teacher Standards. Um, it's nothing that we really need to delve into now at the freshman or even the sophomore level, but do know, get that crystal ball out, it is something that would be in your future. So. It would be remiss to talk about standards and not mention Common Core. So, the U.S. Department of Education has declared, <clears throat> all states and schools will have challenging and clear standards of achievement and accountability for all children and effective strategies for reaching those standards. 
that sounds quite good. It sounds quite important, obviously. As a result, we do have this Common Core State Standards Initiative, the idea of making sure that we're holding all children accountable and that we're looking for similar levels of achievement across states. Sounds good, right? Well, then why the stink face? Why does everybody tend to have this response when they hear the word Common Core? Especially when it comes to Common Core math. I love this one. <clears throat> Jack has a cat. Jill has a pail of water. If Billy has $5, how many figs will his dog eat? Write your constructed response using a bar graph. Um, from a parent's point of view, I can say Common Core math can be a bit wieldy, um, a bit complex and multi-step. And that is something that has caused a great deal of frustration and, and some great memes as well. But the intent of the Common Core standards is quite good. And again, I do want to point out that states did regain some control in this. The states did set their own standards that they would be using for the Common Core initiative. <laughs> Sounds good to me too, John Luke. So make it so. And it's one of those things where if you're working in a public school, you really don't have a lot of control over some of these larger initiatives. Uh, so like it or not, it's something that you need to move forward with. Make it so. So sometimes you just have to make it work. All right. So why? We've talked about what. What are standards now? Why? Why do we need to have standards for content? There are a lot of reasons why, but one of the reasons is because of the people to whom we are accountable. And that is parents. That is also the politicians and the taxpayers. They have concerns about what we're doing in schools and um, what schools expect of children. Parents want to know that their students are getting a good education. They want their children to succeed. They want them to be ready for life after school. Um, part of the Goals 2000 Educate America Act relates to this idea of why we're looking at standards for content. So this act was actually signed in the 1990s. The standards initiative has been going on for about 20 years. It has been a long, time-consuming, but not frivolous act because it is something that, again, has really changed the way we look at education. And, well, let's face it. <laughs> it's the law. So it's something that also is uh, required. When it comes to all the work that has gone into developing these content standards across the states, I do want to point out they help to describe what we're looking for in terms of students' performance, um, as well as how that performance is going to be graded, assessed, evaluated, how it's going to be reported out. Um, it can sometimes seem a bit time consuming and unwieldy. Now here is a snapshot from the textbook looking at some overarching concepts when it comes to standards across different disciplines. And I thought I'd just pull it up here and give you a chance to take a look at it to give you an idea. And you can see it's also continued. This helps you see how there is a connection between the national standards, the common core standards, as well as how this might actually appear on your lesson plan in your classroom. So as you can see, it is a lot of information. So, ah, loud noises. Let me get your attention back here. That was a lot of data in a chart. So focus back when it comes to organizing these standards. Those national standards are meant to serve as kind of a framework to help the states and the local districts to bleed this into its curriculum. So the national start at their standards, it comes down to the states, the states create their common core standards, and then again, hopefully it comes down into the individual classes. All teachers, whether you're a new teacher, whether you're an experienced teacher, it doesn't matter. You're going to rely on those established standards to navigate what it is you're doing in your course. So if you're assigned a class that is fifth grade science, those standards should be quite helpful 
to keep you from, I love that uh, idea down below, navigating the educational sea without going adrift so that you know what is it you're supposed to cover, at what level, what are your students supposed to get out of your course by the end of the year. Uh, also, while we're continuing to still look at the idea of why are there standards for content and organizing those benchmarks, we've mentioned those before, those stepping stones on the way. Um, it is actually more doable to be looking at students' progress at those ben benchmarks rather than just waiting, like we talked about, till they get all the way to the end of the year. By the time they're at the end of the year, there's not much you can do to help them. The year's already over with. You can't course correct. So you've either made it to the right point or you haven't. It makes a lot more sense to do those little benchmarks along the way so that if you find, oh, I'm all the way down here, I still have time to course correct and hopefully get to the right point. So, and I love this little quote down below, just because you covered it, that doesn't mean they learned it. That's why you need to do those little benchmark assessments along the way. So continuing, keeping track of these benchmarks, each teacher has a lot of responsibility. It's their responsibility to teach to that standard to measure whether or not the students have mastered that knowledge um, and if they haven't mastered that knowledge to go back and reteach to them. So, you know, I love the office and any meme that relates to my class from the office I'm bound to use. Um, the idea you don't want to set your bar too low. You know, Michael Scott, he's only going to set it low for limbo. And same thing goes with teachers. Do not set your bar low. Keep your standards up there and try to measure and make sure your students are getting there. And if not, help them reach it. Here's another lovely table from the textbook. And it goes over different professional associations and the type of standards that um, are required of each. So whereas the previous table was showing connections or similar themes across standards at the national and the, and the state level and so on, this is to be looking at similarity in themes or crossover when it comes to disciplines. So for instance, um, goodness, on the far right column in language arts, you see in the middle there are things like evaluating data and developing research skills. And then I would also expect to see similar issues when it comes to topics like science and math. So let's continue. Knowing the standards. So we've talked about what are they, why we have them, organizing them. What about knowing them? If you choose to go forward into the teacher education program, you will become prepared to understand and to meet those in-task standards and to look at professional development in your field. Um, <coughs> pardon me. <laughs> I love this guy here at the left. Oh, when there's so many things to do. Um, sometimes it can seem overwhelming at first, but eventually it does become second nature. So one of the first things you'll be looking at is standards for students. Those standards are going to help guide you to know what you should be teaching them and to help you develop your own assessments to make sure that your students are meeting those standards. And then, uh, yes, standards for teachers as well. So standards that help you know what you should be doing as a teacher and not just what's acceptable and not acceptable, but really what does it mean to be a professional within the world of teaching and knowing the standards for professional practice, that you're responsible for things like planning your lessons, preparing for class, having your classroom set up in a way that is safe as well as conducive for learning using proper instructional strategies and so on. So yes, there's also going to be standards when it comes to professional practice and standards for professional growth, standards, standards, standards. So professional growth, there will be standards to help you know as a teacher, what do you need to do to continue to grow and develop? Um, after you've taught for three or more years, you're um, eligible to go through National Board Certification, which is something we discussed in a previous chapter. So, 
You also need to know when students have met those standards, which is one of the reasons why we do testing. So <laughs> OB1 there, I thought that kind of fit with looking at the idea of testing. So tests need to be administered, and, and that's one thing that's happened with the standards movement is having even more of a focus on these standardized tests and using them in a more frequent manner to get at those benchmarks. Uh, when my daughter was in first grade, I was surprised that she had a standardized reading test given to her about five times throughout the school year. Because again, they're looking at those benchmarks as well as the end result. So um, I thought this also was relevant. It says, <clears throat> I don't know why teachers are complaining that we're not giving them enough time to align the curriculum to new standards, to grade assessments, input the data, generate item analyses, sift through the results and differentiate instruction. What could they possibly be doing all day long? Yes, teaching is a challenging career because there are a lot of things to balance. But as we've discussed in some of our previous chapters, um, especially like going all the way back to chapter one, there's an, an incredible joy that also comes along with teaching, with sharing your gift, with teaching the next generation of students. That just does also have to be counterbalanced with some of this accountability piece. So when it comes to knowing when your students have met the standards. You will be focusing on things like testing, having that accountability, as I just mentioned, accountability, looking at whether or not you're doing what you should be doing in the classroom, as well as those district-wide competency tests. So I just wanted to have a little blurb in here. I think it's interesting that this is obviously a lot of oversight and accountability for public schools. Charter and private schools, not so much, but it depends. So when my daughter went to a private Catholic school, they still did Common Core. They still had all the standardized tests. It was very similar to being in a public school in that respect. But we also attended a different private school for pre-K and kindergarten. They did not have to do any tests or have any accountability whatsoever to the state or to the federal government because they did not take any taxpayer dollars. So sometimes you might find those lack of standards d disturbing, but sometimes schools that have their own autonomy like that can create their own standards. And they do. So curriculum. Let's see how standards relate to what your curriculum is. I do want to point out standards are not a curriculum. Okay, standards don't tell you what you should be teaching. Standards, um, they can be the basis of your curriculum. They can also be the basis of your instructional development. They can be used for that, but standards are what your students need to know and what they should be able to do by the end of the academic year. Curriculum is looking at how they're going to learn it. So my standard might have laid out for me at the end of fifth grade, here are all the things I want my students to know and be able to do. That is my standard. And yes, that's gonna be very helpful to me. My curriculum is, how am I gonna get them there? What am I going to be teaching them? What am I going to have them do in order to learn that and to meet those standards? So not for notes, but I just thought I'd show you. I thought this was a helpful graphic looking at the cycle that happens within the process of building a lesson, how you start off wanting to know. Um, so what is the standard that needs to be met? You go down looking at, OK, so what am I going to do to explain it? Um, how am I going to engage them? Moving on to how you're going to assess it and look at how it worked and keep going. So standards drive it, but curriculum is how you actually teach it. So while standards and benchmarks can create those goals, again, those goals that end mark of where is it I want to go in my class? Where do I want my students to end up? It's curriculum that gives you the path to get there that tells you how am I going to meet that goal? How am I going to get the students to where they need to be by the end of the year? So our textbook goes over a kind of interesting way of looking at curriculum called axioms. So this idea of axioms is a relatively new 
way of looking at curriculum is by Olivia and Gordon. And they offer a view of curriculum by looking at it through 10 different axioms. They provide you with guidelines of ways to look at curriculum, ways to improve curriculum and solve problems you might have within the world, uh, within the world of curriculum. So, all right, Jean-Luc, yes, it is a thing, axiom. I know it's a word we haven't used before in this class, but hold on, you're going to be hearing that word a lot. Axioms of curriculum. So axiom number one, change is both inevitable and necessary for it is through change that life forms grow and develop so to keep in mind when it comes to curriculum things are always going to change curriculum is not static just because you have created what seems to be the most perfect curriculum in the world prepare yourself it's going to change probably the next year um, I can testify to this. So I've been teaching our educational psychology course for about 15 years here at Ohio University. It is never the same course from one year to the next, sometimes not even one semester to the next. I am constantly changing it and updating it and making it more relevant. And, you know, you would think that after 15 years, it would be perfect and I could just push play and be done. But that's not how curriculum works. Um, change is necessary to make it relevant, uh, to help the course to grow. So axiom number two, a school curriculum not only reflects, but is also a product of its time. Well, I think that also connects to the idea that curriculum changes. So I love this over here with Newman. Um, <laughs> um, although it's from Jurassic Park, I don't think this curriculum meets the student's needs. See, nobody cares, just teach it. Not true, not true, we do care. Um, your curriculum needs to meet the needs of your students and those things change. Look at how COVID has affected curriculum. Look at how political changes have affected curriculum. Look at how um, issues within um, racial diversity have affected curriculum. So it is a product of its time. Axiom three. Curriculum changes made at an earlier period can exist concurrently with newer curriculum changes at a later period. So meaning there are layers and curriculum can overlap. So even though you might have new things coming about in your math curriculum, you can still have the old math in there as well. You can be teaching rote memorization and using flashcards while also doing common core math. That's axiom three. Um, axiom four, Curriculum change results from changes in people. Well, that makes sense. It is people that make curriculum. It's people that's teaching it. It's people that's learning it. So changes in people lead to changes in curriculum. And my little meme below just is relevant because I think all teachers can relate to this. The idea of trying to get everything to fit in by the end of the semester. Let's continue with axiom five. Curriculum change is effected as a result of a cooperative endeavor on the part of groups. Teachers, professional planners, and curriculum developers must work together to effect positive curricular change. Now you'll notice politicians were not in that list. Um, I love this meme over here. So teachers do not like it when politicians come in and tell us how to teach. Curriculum change is a cooperative process, but it typically works best when it is a cooperative process among people who are involved, experienced, and educated about curriculum. Axiom six, curriculum development is basically a decision-making process. Well, yes, because again, if the curriculum is your path that gets you to your goal, there's a lot of decisions to be made there. And axiom seven, curriculum development is a never ending process. So my little meme over here about your resolution that you'll fully embrace um, all of the thrilling new changes to curriculum. It can sometimes get a little bit old as a teacher when you're constantly being told by your administrators that there's changes to the curriculum. That you know, the newest, biggest, best software has come out or new standards or a new way of looking at things. But one of the axioms here is basically telling us you just need to embrace that. Curriculum development is never ending. It is always going on.
And that makes sense considering everything else we've seen, that curriculum is um, a product of its time, that it's connected to its students, that it's a decision-making process, and so on. So obviously it's going to change. It's not going to be static and be blind to changes in the environment around it. So Axiom 8, curriculum development is a comprehensive process. Yes, it is. Um, I find myself constantly both uh, thrilled and overwhelmed when I'm looking at curriculum development. Because like I said, I overhaul my course every year and looking at all the little things you have to look at when you do that. You have to look at your assessments. You have to look at, you know, both your exams and your homeworks and your quizzes. You have to look at the way you're teaching. You have to look at what it is that you're presenting. It's, it's a comprehensive process. Number nine, systemic curriculum development is more effective than trial and error. I do know what that word means. So systemic curriculum development means doing it throughout the entire school, throughout the entire grade or the entire subject, throughout the system, not just here and there, not just, oh, I'm going to tweak this lesson and this lesson. It's more effective if you do it systemically. So yes, I do know what that word means. <laughs> Axiom 10. The curriculum planner starts from where the curriculum is, just as the teacher starts from where the students are. So when you're jumping in and you're thinking that you're ready to overhaul some curriculum, you got to start off with, well, where am I now? Where is the curriculum now and work from there? Don't try to jump 10 steps ahead. So yes, yes, let the understanding flow through you. I know it has been a lot. Um, just a little bit more. So when talking about accountability measures, it's important to note that accreditation agencies, and there are lots of them, both national and regional accreditors, as well as sometimes even state level accreditors, local school districts, state and national departments of ed are going to demand evidence of teacher effectiveness before licensure, before tenure of teachers. Um, another way we look at accountability is something called value added assessment. Um, trying to look at um, how much value or improvement has occurred over a period of time. <laughs> so uh, finally, when we're looking at school accountability, this is where the rubber really meets the road, that if accountability is not met, then those policymakers, whether it is your superintendent, whether it is your, even your governor, whatever level or agency we're looking at, those policymakers are going to have to look at your practices and try to figure out an improvement plan or what needs to occur. So accountability, as Will, Fer Will Ferrell here says, it's kind of a big deal. So what if I told you this was it? So yes, this was everything for chapter 10, a slightly shorter chapter than usual, but packed full of a lot of details. So I think the uh, time on this should suffice. Thank you for your time and attention. And that is it for chapter 10.